Let's take a look at the three free response related to this review. Uh, number 12, elephants sometimes damage trees in Africa. It turns out that elephants dislike bees. They recognize beehives in areas where they are common and avoid them. Can this be used to help elephants keep elephants away from trees? A group in Kenya placed active beehives in some trees and empty beehives in others. Will elephants damage be less in trees with hives? Will even empty hives keep elephants away? Researchers want to design an experiment to answer these questions using 72 Achia trees. Part A, identify the experimental units, treatments, and the response variable. The experimental units are the Achia trees. There are three treatments, either an active hive, an empty hive, or no hive. And the response variable is the damage done by the elephants to the trees. Part B. Describe how the researchers could carry out a completely randomized design for this experiment. Include a description of how the treatments should be assigned. First thing you want to do is come up with a way to randomly assign that. Let me talk about a few ways. If you use a random number generator, what you would do is you would say that you would randomly assign the numbers 0, 1 to 72 to each of the Achaea trees. Then you would use a random number generator to pick, the first, uh, pick 24 two-digit numbers in this range. Uh, you would ignore repeats in this case. Uh, those trees, the first 24, uh, will get the beehives. Uh, the trees associated with the next 24 digits, um, again, uh, uh, not including repeats, will get uh, the non-active beehives, and then the remaining trees that were not picked will get no beehives whatsoever. Another way you could do it is you could randomly assign the numbers 0, 1 to 72 to, to the 72 trees. And then on separate sizes of equally sized paper, put each of those numbers on them. Put them in a hat. Randomly pick the first 24 slips of paper and assign those to be the active beehives. The next 24 slips of paper will be the empty beehives, and those left over will have no beehive. Then after the experiment is completed, you will then compare the damage caused uh, to the trees of using the three different methods. Uh, one thing to be cautious of when you talk about setting up the random assignment, um, if there's a process where you would have repeating numbers, you must address what to do with the repeats, to include them or not to include them. If you use pieces of paper, they must be equally sized pieces of paper. Uh, very important to talk about that. If you assign numbers, if they're two-digit numbers, then the single digits must have leading zeros in front of them so they look like two digits. Keep these factors in mind. They're very important. Number 13. A 2008 New York Times article on public opinion about steroid use in baseball discussed the results of a sample survey. The survey found that 34% of adults think that at least half of Major League Baseball players use steroids to enhance their athletic performance. Another 36% thought that about a quarter of the Major League Baseball players use surveys, and 8% had no opinion. Here is the part of the time statement on how the poll was conducted. The latest New York Times uh, news poll is based on telephone interviews conducted March 15th through March 18th with 1,067 adults throughout the United States. The sample of telephone calls, uh, numbers called, was randomly selected by a computer from a list of more than 42,000 active residential uh, exchanges across the country. The exchanges were chosen to ensure that each region of the country was represented in proportion to its population. In each exchange, random digits were added to form a complete telephone number, thus permitting access to listed and unlisted numbers. In each household, one adult was designated as a random procedure to be the respondent for the survey. Part A. Explain why the sampling method used in this survey was not a simple random sample. Remember for a simple random sample, every single possible outcome of your particular sample size must have the equal likely opportunity of happening. One of the main reasons why this is not considered a simple random sample is this statement here. The exchanges were chosen to ensure that each region of the country was represented in proportion to its population. So that means if we were looking at the east coast of the United States, 
the sample of just having all East Coast respondents could never happen because they were trying to be proportionate with the population and how it was spread out. So therefore, it's not considered a simple random sample. Uh, letter B, why was one adult chosen at random in each household to represent the survey? Now, the reason they randomly chose um, when they got to a household is because they were trying to control for lurking variables. A potential lurking variable might be perhaps that household members who generally answer the phone have a different opinion from those that don't answer the phone. So to control for always getting the same person that answers that phone at that house, let's randomly pick someone and try to control for that lurking variable. Letter C. Explain how undercoverage could lead to bias in the sample survey. Undercoverage definitely did exist in this survey. Um, those who do not have telephones and those who have only cell phones were not part of the sampling frame, so though their opinions were never measured. Um, since cell phone users tend to be younger in this case, uh, the results of the survey may not accurately reflect the entire population. If they're just calling those with landlines, we would assume that maybe older people tend to have the landlines where the younger people don't. So we're going to be overstating our responses of how the older population would feel about baseball and not capturing the true opinion of everybody. Number 14. Many people start their day with a jolt of caffeine from coffee or a soft drink. Some experts agree that people who take in large amounts of caffeine each day may suffer from physical withdrawal symptoms if they stop ingesting their usual amounts of coffee or caffeine. Researchers recruited 11 volunteers who were caffeine dependent and who were willing to take part in a caffeine withdrawal experiment. The experiment was conducted on two-day periods that occurred one week apart. During one of the two-day periods, each subject was given a capsule containing the amount of caffeine normally ingested by that subject in one day. During the other study period, the subjects were given placebos. The order in which each subject received the two types of capsules was randomly was randomized. The subjects' diets were restricted during each of the study periods. And at the end of two days' study periods, subjects were evaluated using a tapping task in which uh, they were instructed to press a button 200 times as fast as they could. Part A, how and why was blocking used in the design of this experiment? This is a great example of matched pairs, which is a method of blocking. This is considered matched pairs because each participant took the caffeine tablets in one of the two sessions and the placebo in the other. So in this case, the participant was actually the block themselves and they were given two different treatments. Uh, so you're going to see the participant be the block, two different treatments, and then they're going to analyze the results or compare the results of the two treatments on the one block, who is each of the 11 individual volunteers. Letter B. Why did researchers randomize the order in which subject received the two treatments? The randomization of these treatments was, one, very important, but it was done primarily to control for any possible influence of the order of the treatments. Um, we don't want the people to know if they have a placebo or not. We want them to feel like they're always getting that caffeine and just to act normally. So to control for any outside influences, uh, possibly um, their own mental capacity of thinking if they have caffeine or not, uh, to make an impact on when they are trying to hit that button 200 times as fast as they could. Part C, could this experiment have been carried out in a double blind manner? Absolutely, it's possible to carry out this double blind. In a double blind, that basically means the person getting the treatment doesn't know which treatment they're getting, and the person actually giving the treatment or assigning the treatment also doesn't know. This could happen as long as we had a third party involved. If we had a third person involved where maybe they had uh, treatment one in a container and then treatment two in a different container, um, if someone randomly put these in here, and assigned uh, the treatments to different containers, they could give these two treatments to the person who's going to carry out the study and not telling them where things are put. And then that person could then give the two treatments randomly to the actual participant. This would be considered a double-blind experiment.